think the Greater Texas Foundation is a, a very good example of this, of a very small foundation, makes about $4 million in grants annually, and is trying to impact college access and success across the entire state of Texas. Made this realization. And if you look at their strategy, it's a combination now of talking to national funders to get their interest and investment in Texas, aligning the efforts of all the state-based funders, convening meetings between, between policymakers, between um, superintendents and, and independent higher education, and higher education presidents and nonprofits, commissioning research and bringing that to bear in the problem. And they've really created, with a, again, um, probably less than $1 million, $2 million in investment, they've created a groundswell of momentum in that state to change the way that college access persistent success happens in Texas. And lastly, the last practice we saw was around what we call building actionable knowledge. And this was from an internal perspective to improve your own practice, but from an external practice to use data and bring it to bear, um, not to measure or track performance, but to yield impact. And one of my, one of my favorite examples of this is, is greatschools.net, which not a funder, but as a nonprofit, looked at collecting data about schools around the country and making it available to everyone. Um, and the number of people on that site, every year about one third of parents in the country are on their site making decisions about where to send their kids to school, where to live. Um, and they learned through that. It was remarkable when you talk to Bill Jackson who founded that organization. He says the biggest thing that that data allowed us to do was to form a trusted relationship with families and parents. And that's now allowing us to reach them in, in, in other ways with different kinds of information to help their kids get better education. Um, and when you look across these practices, I think that the, really the one message that I hope you really take away from this is to think expansively and to think big and to ask yourself not who do I support and how do I make good grants, but to ask yourself what's the problem I'm trying to solve? Who are the people I need to work with to solve it? What are the assets that I have at my disposal and how do I use all of them to get to where we need to get to? Um, and that's what I think of as kind of catalytic philanthropy. And I want to use that, I'm going to take us back to a minute to, um, to the juvenile justice system and, and, uh, and tell another story. So I found about, uh, I guess it was about a, a year and a half ago now, I, I walked in as part of a project that, I, that we were doing to a secure detention facility in Brooklyn. And I don't know, uh, just raise your hand, how many people have ever been in a prison, a youth or adult prison? Quite a few. Uh, ra raise your hand if you were just visiting versus you had to be there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I won't ask which, why the reason you were there. But for those of you who've been, it was a lot of you, you know these are incredibly bleak, depressing places where not much good is happening. I mean, this picture up here is not, it's, it's not inconsistent. It's kids in an institutional setting, in jumpsuits, every door is locked, barbed wire around them. Nothing good happening. And we were there because we were doing a project similar to what, what, um, what what the Tau Foundation started in Connecticut, we were doing a similar effort to align the juvenile justice system in the state of New York. And we were doing a focus group with young women who were in one of these secure detention facilities. And I will keep with me in my heart the story of the, uh, that one, woman shared, one young woman shared with us. So she was, at the time we met her, 16. And she had her first interaction with the juvenile justice system when she was 14 and a half uh, because she shoplifted a pair of $50 sneakers. Um, now, if she was white, she wasn't, she was African American. If she was white, we have a juvenile justice system that works well for white kids. Her parents would have got a call, they would have picked her up, there would have been a lot of conversations that happened, there would have been different, a totally different outcome for that child. For her, picked up, wound up in a facility for a number of weeks before she was able to be released to her family. Uh, within four months of being released from this, this first encounter, and again, this first offense, very minor offense, she wound up missing a probation appointment because she was at a doctor's appointment. Violated probation, put back into, this time, a more secure facility for eight months. Within two months of leaving that, she was arrested for having a violent fight where she had harmed another child. And now, at the time we had met her and interviewed her, she'd been there for over a year. It just, it just, the, the story, it just broke my heart to think about, like, we had this young woman at this point where she'd made a mistake, and I don't know a single 14-year-old who hasn't made some kind of mistake like that. But at that point, it set her on this path, this spiral downward. And we started really looking at why that was the case. Like, why did this happen? Why did she not receive the support she needed to avoid that second encounter? Why in that second encounter did it lead to this, this path where instead of getting extra support and connections back into school, it set her on, on this journey where now, like, you know, the, the chances are most likely, if you look at the statistics, she will just graduate from this system to the adult system. A huge waste. Um, and in New York State, they spend $286,000 per child who winds up in their, in their secure facilities per year. 
Anyone want to guess what the recidivism rate is for kids who wind up in that circumstance? Shout it out. Let's hear it loud. 89% recidivism. And this was a system, and, and I call it a system very loosely, because one of the first things we did when we started our work is we mapped the system. And I'm going to show you briefly kind of what it looked like when we mapped it. So this is the New York, City, the New York State juvenile justice system. Wait for it. Wait for it. Still coming. And there you have it. It is thousands of organizations. It is state agencies. It is county agencies. It's the courts. It's the police departments. It's the schools touch it. Mental health touches it. Physical health touches it. There's hundreds and hundreds of public and private providers, ranging from you know, just rehabilitative services and treatments to secure and, 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 and other facilities. And none of them work together. They don't share data. They don't share a common purpose and vision. They each have their own individual goals. And if you look at any single organization in that system, they will tell you what their job is. And they'll tell you they're doing it. Yet together, when you put it all together, these 15-year-olds wind up spiraling downward and in it over and over again. And you have an 89% recidivism rate. Well-meaning people. And out of great tragedy in New York, I mean, the, the, that system wound up being under a federal lawsuit. It wound up having youth who had died while in... In, in facilities. It had adult workers who had been killed by kids in facilities. And thankfully, you know, out of a crisis like that, change came out of it. And I'll talk a little bit more about what changed in this system a, a little bit later. Because at its heart, what you just saw in that diagram, to me, it speaks to the kinds of problems that we're addressing in the social sector. And I'll, I'll take a step back and just say that this is, a, to us, like this idea of what kinds of problems we're trying to solve was at the heart of collective impact and, it's, and how it emerged, at least at FSG. And we looked at kind of three kinds of problems. And many of you might have seen this. Ron Heffitz writes a lot about these kind of problems as well. But simple problems. Baking a cake. For some reason, I can't do it. But they tell me if you follow a recipe, you get a cake. And if you do it the next day, you follow a recipe, you'll get the same cake. And if you do it a week from Sunday, if you follow the recipe, you'll get the same cake. It's a simple problem. It's got a formula. You can solve it. And then you can repeat that solution. Even much more complicated problem. I'll use the example of sending a rocket to the moon much more challenging, the physics and science and materials and development of the ideas, but still there's a science to it. And once you do it once, you can do it again because you learn how to do it. It's got a technical solution. The third kind of problem is when I would think about like, rehabilitating a youth or ensuring that a, a, a child grows to be a successful adult. There's no recipe. There's no formula. You might do exactly, I can think about my three kids, I, if I did exactly the same thing with all three of them, the outcomes would be completely different. And what works for my daughter is not going to work for my son, and it's not going to work for my other son. It's a completely complex, adaptive problem that requires not just me. And I think back to that system in Actors in New York. No one organization is going to solve it. Me as a parent, there's an awful lot I can do, but I'm also dependent upon schools. I'm dependent upon after-school programs and coaches. I'm dependent upon doctors. I'm dependent upon social workers. I'm dependent upon a huge number of adults and systems and organizations that are all, in some way, from small to big, going to play a role in ensuring that my kids grow up to be successful adults. As a control freak, that scares the heck out of me, but that's the way it is. Um, and I think in the social sector, the problem is that we tend to treat these complex problems as if they were simple or complicated. So I'll tell you a story, and this is, a, this is what I think um, about uh, uh, the paradigm of the social sector. And it's been this way for decades, decades and decades. And, and you can nod your heads or say, mm-hmm, if this story resonates with you. But this is how social change happens in the social sector. We have a problem. Pick your problem. Pick any problem you want. We go out and we look for a solution. We found it. There is a great program. It's doing remarkable work. It's getting great results. So we commission a study. We study it for three years or five years or 10 years to prove that it works. Then we're going to replicate it, and the public funding is going to come in, and it's going to grow everywhere. And then we're going to do it again for the next problem. And for decades, we've, as a social sector, this is how we've tried to solve social problems. And by any objective measure, we just have not achieved the results that we would hope to see with the resources we're expending in the social sector. And it's literally because we are trying to solve these complex problems as if they were technical as if there was an answer. Um, and when we saw this, you know, these, these, that we said traditional approaches are just not working to solve social problems. So what winds up happening in that world where you're looking for great organizations is that funders select individual grantees. They're in the game of picking winners. 
and nonprofits compete for resources. They each have to prove that they're doing great. They can't show weakness or that they're making mistakes and learning from them. They have to put their best foot forward to get the dollars. And evaluation is about a single effort and what that effort is trying to yield. Um, and large-scale change is assumed that it's going to happen by scaling individual organizations. And it just isn't getting us where we need to get to. And it's not because it, it ignores a couple of really important things. It ignores the resources that exist in a community. It assumes the answer has to come from the outside. It assumes that what works in one community can be taken and replicated and moved to another community. So I started my career, my early parts of my career, I was running a nonprofit in, in Harlem. And at the time, how many of you have heard of the Harlem Children's Zone? Fair number. Um, so at the time, they were the Riedland Children's Center. And I remember the first time I met Jeff Canada. And how many here have heard Jeff Canada speak? So the first time I met Jeff Canada, we were both principals for a day at the same school in, the, in, in uh, Washington Heights. So at the lunchtime, they pulled all the kids together, and the principal came up and introduced me and introduced Jeff Canada and said, now we're going to hear a few words. They didn't tell us we had to speak a few words. We're going to hear a few words from our two principals for a day. So Jeffrey Canada goes up and talks, and tears start flowing, and cheers start happening. And there's this incredible opera because he's amazing, and he's got a story, and he makes connections, and he's a powerful talker. And I'm standing there saying, I, there's nothing I can say. Like Jeffrey Canada, you cannot replicate Jeffrey Canada. You can do what he's doing in other places, but the, the charisma and the story and the efforts he brought that resulted in the funding, that resulted in the connections, you can't replicate Jeffrey Canada. I'm now convinced also after the morning session that you also can't replicate Michelle. Um, I was just incredibly moved by her story, and I, I just, as she talked, I kept thinking it was like a, a great opportunity for reflection about how far we've come and how far we still have to go. And at the same time, also, for me at least, it was an inspiration that I, I really left from hearing her that we can get there and, and we will get there. Um, you can't replicate things like that. And we call this, in, in the article, we call this isolated impact. And it's not bad. It's not that people are doing bad things. And it's not that organizations aren't strong. It's not that those agencies I just pointed out in the juvenile justice system had the wrong work. It just, when it added up together, it wasn't adding up to what it was supposed to add up to. So we imagined a different world. We imagined a world where people worked across sectors, where they had a common idea of the problem they wanted to solve, where they set similar goals and tracked goals. It was remarkable in that New York juvenile justice system, they actually agreed, and I'll get to that story in a minute, but they agreed that recidivism was what they needed to measure as one of the most important measures of success. Yet across the organizations, 23 organizations on our steering committee, there were 180 different definitions of recidivism. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm glad you're laughing. When they told us that, our team was not laughing. <laughs> our team was like, holy sh <laughs> What are we going to do? Um, but that, that organizations actually actively co they align their work. They coordinate their work. They, they work together with purpose toward goals that they agree on. And this is what we called collective impact. And to me, the simplest way I have of describing collective impact, and I'll get into some of the technical aspects of it soon, but the simplest way I have to describing it of it is that every nonprofit organization has a vision. And it's always an aspirational statement that if you could achieve would be remarkable. But then when you go down to the mission, you look and you say, goodness, with that mission, you can see how you can contribute to that vision, but there's no way it's going to lead to that vision. To me, at its heart, collective impact is a way to take the missions of dozens or hundreds even of organizations and ensure that together they add up to that vision. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, and I want to be really clear, it's very different from collaboration. We did a conference on collective impact about a year and a half ago at Stanford, and one of the first things we asked people to do was raise your hand if you're involved in collective impact. And 80% of the room raised their hand. And we were thinking, wow, that's great. That's so cool. They came. They're, they're disciples. We're going to give them better tools. They're going to go back out. They're going to do a better job. And then we went through our framework for collective impact. And people were scratching their heads a bit. And people were like, ooh, we're not doing that. And so we asked the question again, how many people here are involved in collective impact? And about 10% raised their hand. And 